The changing climate is one of the most important issues facing us at this point in history. And there is a lot of discussion about our responsibility as humans, um, how our activities, namely the burning of fossil fuels for energy, has affected the climate and can continue to affect the climate. Let's begin by addressing the question, what are fossil fuels? Fossil fuels are defined as the anaerobically decomposed remains of prehistoric organisms. Largely, they come from uh, photosynthetic organisms like plants. The fossil fuels that we use for energy include things like oil, uh, natural gas, as well as coal. These fossil fuels were formed over millions of years. Uh, we then dig them up, remove them from the earth, and we burn them to provide energy to power our uh, technologies. Fossil fuels are considered a non-renewable resource, which means that they don't regenerate or that they regenerate so incredibly slowly that we are using them much, much faster than they would ever be replaced. Some of the fossil fuels that we use have been around for as long as 650 million years, but the vast majority of the coal that we use was formed um, after the Carboniferous period. So the Carboniferous was uh, between 359 to 299 million years ago, and during that period, the landscape of much of the planet was covered with swamp forests. Um, these were forests made up of early plants, uh, seedless vascular plants, things like our modern day club mosses and ferns. These plants grew quickly and covered much of the northern hemisphere. When these early plants died, their remains formed a dense organic layer. So thinking about photosynthesis, what are plants doing when they photosynthesize? Well, they're removing carbon dioxide from the air, from the atmosphere, using the carbon from that carbon dioxide in the process of photosynthesis to turn those molecules into organic molecules such as sugars to be used for energy and also to be used to build their plant tissues. So all of the carbon that is uptaken by photosynthetic organisms is um, either used for energy or stored in their tissues. And the energy that is used to build those organic molecules, energy from the sun, is essentially trapped. It's stored in those bonds that are holding those organic molecules together. So when photosynthetic organisms like these seedless vascular forests um, die and fall down, they need to decompose in order to release the stored carbon in their tissues. However, at this point in the history of the Earth, there were not that many organisms that were very quick at decomposing trees and um, other types of plants. And so before these remains could decompose, they were covered by other sedimentary layers. And over millions of years, under conditions of heat and pressure, those organic deposits turned into um, what we now know as coal. So coal is rich in carbon because it comes from the anaerobically decomposed remains of these prehistoric plants. It's also rich in energy because that stored energy from prehistoric photosynthesis is trapped in those bonds. So when we dig it up and burn it, we are releasing that energy, which we can harness to use to power our technologies. We are also releasing the carbon that's stored in those uh, organic bonds. When coal is burned and carbon is released, that carbon reacts with oxygen that is already present in the atmosphere and that forms carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide is one of the compounds that is described as a greenhouse gas. And if you've ever been inside of a greenhouse, you know that it is much warmer inside the greenhouse than it is outside the greenhouse. And that's because the glass acts as an insulator. So the sunlight energy can penetrate the glass and it warms the interior of the greenhouse before uh, those energy waves can escape again. So greenhouse gases behave in a similar manner to the panes of glass in the greenhouse by trapping heat and trapping moisture inside of the atmosphere. 
it is important to have greenhouse gases at certain concentrations in the atmosphere in order to maintain the temperature of the planet at a level that can sustain life. So we do need some greenhouse gases. Besides carbon dioxide, other greenhouse gases are water vapor. Um, methane is also a greenhouse gas. Nitrous oxide is a greenhouse gas. So carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas. It is just the one that's um, increasing in concentration as we release carbon stored in the bonds of coal um, by burning it for energy. When we have an increase in carbon dioxide, we have an increase in that insulating layer um, in the atmosphere, which traps more of the sunlight energy inside of the atmosphere and causes an overall increase in the average global temperature. Another way to illustrate the greenhouse effect is to think about uh, what happens inside of a closed car on a hot day. And this is the reason that you don't leave your dog or your children inside of a locked uh, and closed up car because the glass acts just like the glass in a greenhouse and traps that sunlight energy inside the car as heat. Let's take a look at a couple of graphs that illustrate the correlation between atmospheric carbon dioxide and global temperature. So these graphs on the left hand side, this top graph is looking at temperature and the bottom graph is looking at concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And notice that we're looking at historical data. So we're going back more than 400,000 years in both instances. What stands out is that as you see the levels of carbon dioxide decreasing, you also see a corresponding decrease in temperature. And when you see those carbon dioxide concentrations rising again, you also see a corresponding rise in temperature. What's notable is that this appears to be happening in a cyclical fashion, which is true. Um, and this is normal. What is not normal is when we look at what's going on in the very recent history. So the graphs on the right hand side, again, this graph is looking at carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere over the last uh, 400,000 years plus. And we see the same cyclical formation of um, carbon dioxide concentrations going up and down in the atmosphere. What's alarming is what's going on right about here where we see this dramatic spike in concentrations from far above sort of this maximum baseline uh, data points. This present day value is, as you can see, clearly far above that. And when you zoom in to uh, change the scale of the time graph a little bit here on the X, you can see just since 1955 to a little bit before present day, that carbon dioxide concentration is just continuing to uh, increase. So this is another graph that came from the U.S. Energy Information Administration's website, and it's just showing the um, correlation between carbon dioxide emissions since the 1750s and carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere since the same point in time. And it's clearly um, increasing on both accounts. So for emissions, you see a really sharp uptick right about 1900 and continuing to increase up until modern times. Um, this is exactly correlated with the Industrial Revolution. So as we start using more en energy, we are burning more natural um, resources, we're using more coal and more oil, and uh, those are producing carbon emissions. Correspondingly, you can see the concentration of atmospheric CO2 on this brown line, um, also at about 300 parts per million back here in the 1750s, up, pre holding pretty steady again until about the time of the Industrial Revolution where it starts to increase and we are up above 400 parts per million in modern times. So emissions are increasing and the concentration in the atmosphere continues to increase as well, which is just increasing the insulatory effect of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. As concentrations of carbon dioxide continue to rise, we are seeing increased uh, global temperature, which is the number one concern 
um, when we start talking about climate change. In November of 2018, the fourth National Climate Assessment Report was released uh, outlining the data that has been collected and analyzed about climate change since the last assessment was released a couple of years prior to that. And this is just a figure that comes from part of that report that is outlining some indicators of climate change. So some of the effects that we are looking at and sort of being aware of are, of course, the increase in temperature, which leads to more heat waves, which has impacts on community health and ecosystem health. We're talking about uh, melting sea ice, increasing sea levels, talking about changes in weather patterns, heavy rains, um, changes in drought conditions, less snow, which all are going to indicate um, or affect growing season, which is important for crops, which is important for food. Um, looking at things like ocean acidification as a result of increased carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere as well, uh, increases in wildfires, as well as greater demands on our energy for heating and cooling, which is sort of a self-fulfilling cycle when the energy that we use for cooling comes from burning fossil fuels. So this is a good source of information to learn more about what's going on with the climate and what sort of challenges we're facing in the future.